Lutheran Church. And it's time to end. Hallelujah. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you this morning for this wonderful opportunity that we can stand in your presence. Oh God, right now your servant is about to deliver the word which you have sent to the church this morning. Oh God, I pray for special anointing. Then the word that goes forth, Lord, is like fire to consume everything that is contrary to you. Send your word to heal, your word to deliver. Send your word that, Lord God, that will build your people up so that we can become, my God, the people you designed for us to be. Oh God, only your word can take us there. So this morning, Lord, anoint your servant and minister to him that he will minister to us today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon, church. Greetings to you. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Savior, and soon coming King. Welcome back, Bishop, and to the Carmen. Trust you had a restful time and are refreshed and ready to go again. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to see him. Just to look upon his face. And there to sing forever. All his saving grace. On those streets of glory. We hold on to the hope we have in Christ. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. If you turn to me in the Bible, to the book of Philippians, sorry, Acts chapter 3, I'm going to read from verse 1 to 11. And he reads as follows. Now Peter went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man laying from his mother's womb was carried, whom they daily, who lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who enter the temple. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and 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 the bones received strength. So he leaping up, stood, and walked and entered the temple with them. Walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat uh, by the gate begging. So they knew that it was he who was sat who was begging arms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's Great, which is called Solomon's Greatly Amazed. And one of the uh, uh, verse of scripture is Philippians 119, a very familiar passage of scripture. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. Amen. The theme I'd like to bring to us, to our attention today, is it's not what you want, but what you need. It's not what you want, but what you need. 
uh, as, as children, as boys, um, Christmas was quite disappointing for us when it came to Christmas. <laughs> There were no mobile phones, no laptops, PlayStation, iPods, and all that kind of things. You know, what we wanted was some games, some toys. You know, all our friends were getting things like Scale Electric. Remember Scale Electric? Yeah. <laughs> Robots and car toys and stuff like that. A lot of friends were getting those stuff, but for us, we weren't getting those sort of things. Um, these are certain things that we wanted, but there was somebody who knew what we really needed at the time, and that was Mama. What we got were pyjamas, <laughs> socks, underpants, vests. She knew that a year old, that's what we would need. So despite what we wanted, Mom knew what we needed, and she gave us what we needed. And God knows exactly what we need, when we need it. You know, he's always able to meet the needs of his children. Philippians, what we read, Philippians 4, this was uh, Paul's letter of joy. He begins by acknowledging the, the Philippian church and said that they were the only ones to give him financial support uh, for his ministry. At the time when he left, uh, the Greek states in Macedonia. And he reminds them in verse 15 of, of chapter 4, he says, When I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. And in verse 16 he adds, For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me again and again when I was in need. And Paul experienced what it was to be in need. And so he gave uh, a, a promise uh, to the Philippians, and he says that my God shall supply all your needs according to Christ, uh, his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. Now it's important to note the difference between wants and need. A need is something that is absolutely essential. You'll agree with that, right? Yes. You know, um, it's, it's, it's uh, that which is needed in order to live, in order to survive, such as food and water and air, shelter and clothing, such things that you depend on and, and cannot uh, do without. A want is something that you would like to have. You see a nice pair of shoes? I want one of those. You see a man in a nice suit? I like that suit, I want one of those. See a man in a nice car? Yeah, I want one like that. And it's, I want it something that you desire, not something that you need, not something that is essential for life, it's just something that you desire to have. Now, the Jews observe uh, three times of prayer each day. Nine o'clock, three o'clock, and that at sunset. Now, at these times, devout um, Jews and Gentiles uh, who believed in God would make their way to the temple to pray. And uh, Peter and John were on their way going to the temple for the afternoon service. And as they were making their way there, there was a crippled man that was being carried in and placed at his usual uh, uh, position at the temple gate. Now this beggar, as described in the book Acts, was probably about 40 years old, or, or, or more than 40 years old actually. Uh, and he was most likely, uh, I want to picture it, probably a, a pitiful sight. He had been, uh, you know, probably been in this position for about uh, 30, maybe 40 years. And for him, all hope of a normal life was gone. And he had been this way for a long time, and there was no uh, expectation of any change. He couldn't work, he was dependent on others, uh, there was a loss of dignity. And his standard of life was probably pretty pitiful. But he was placed outside the church every single day. And he was actually strategically placed at the entrance of the temple. And uh, many people who would pass by uh, the entrance of their way to worship would see him 
and uh, give him money. And for the Jews who were accustomed to it, you know, if you uh, see to, to, to give to the poor, it was seen as a good thing. And people seem to be more concerned about looking good than actually meeting the real need uh, of, of this, this beggar. So he was strategically placed at this place every single day. Now, in verse 3 of Acts chapter 3, the Bible says, when he saw Peter, this is a beggar, when he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he did what uh, he usually would do. Please, sir, can you spare some change? Yes. You heard that when you walk down the street? Yes. Please, sir, can you spare some change? And this is probably what the, the beggar said uh, to Peter and John. Now, what the beggar didn't realize is that uh, these men had not long been in the upper room and received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. These men were now empowered to do great things. So he saw Peter and John as no different from any other customer who would give him a handout. Not knowing that these men were capable of giving him a lot more than he wanted. Verse 4 to 5 says of the beggar, and fixing his eyes on him, with John and Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his full attention, expecting to receive something from them. Now, understand that at first, Peter disappoints the beggar because he's expecting them to put their hand in their pocket and hand him some change. So he's quite disappointed initially. But this served only to heighten the value of the great gift that he was about to receive. And that was complete restoration, complete health. So as far as the beggar was concerned, his need was for money. Money so that he could perhaps pay his bills, um, pay for his care, um, pay for his transportation, be a little less dependable. He couldn't see beyond his present situation. But Peter and John, being full of the Holy Ghost, heard that what the man wanted, but they knew what he needed. They said, look at us. And the beggar looked expectantly for a handout, not knowing that he was about to receive a handout. So verse 6 says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The verse 7 says, And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, so that he was leaping up. He stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. So he didn't get what he expected, but he received what he needed. The beggar didn't want his money, but instead he received something even better, complete healing and deliverance. The ability to walk for the first time in his life. What would this mean for this man? It would mean independence. No more needs to be carried. No needs to depend on handouts. He could get a job and people would no longer look down on him in pity. His dignity would be restored. Understand, if he continued to, to receive money, there would be no change. The situation would be no different. But in receiving what he needed, he received a life-transforming experience. And uh, we need to, you know, you know we, we often ask God for something. And it may seem as though God is silent, God has ignored us, God is deaf, or whatever things like the going are on our minds once we ask and make a request of God. But He may be saying at that time, I've got something better for you. And we ask God for what we want, but don't be surprised if He doesn't give you what you want because, simply because He has something better in store for you. He might not give you what you want, but it's more interested in giving you what you need. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. You see, God doesn't deal in temporary fixes. No. You see, if the man received money, he would only get a temporary fix, and he would only be able to minister to temporary needs. But God is concerned about a complete transformation, not temporary fixes. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. So what they need is to be provided. You see, when we think about um, a drug addict, for example, he wants the next fix. But the next fix is only going to give him a temporary high and he's going to come down. See, what a drug addict needs is complete deliverance. He wants the next fix, but we know his need is complete deliverance. So God is not interested in temporary fixes. Hallelujah. So had Peter and John given the lame man money, as I said, he would have been lame for the rest of his life. But that day, he experienced a transformation that brought change to his life. Now, God sees the bigger picture. We've always got to, to bear that in mind. God always sees the bigger picture. C.S. Lewis says, whether we like it or not, God intends to give us what we need and not what we think we need. And often we pray for what we believe is the best option for us at any given moment in time. And often that moment of desperation, our vision gets kind of cloudy and we, we are limited to what we know today. We're unable to, to see the bigger picture that uh, there's a better option for us. And, and this is where God uh, withholds uh, giving us what we've asked for so that he can give us the better option of what he wants for us. Now, author and preacher Louis Diglio says, God plans for your life are f uh, far more exceed the circumstances of your day. I'll say that again. God's plans for your life far exceed the circumstances of your day. Now, most of us have any one time or another have had one thing that we wanted from God, but somehow he has withheld it from us. And that might be, you know, a better job. It might be uh, a wife, husband, that nice house that you were trying to get that perhaps uh, fell through. And, uh, you know, um, we question our minds, you know, God, why not? Why did I not get that woman that my, you know, my heart was there and I was hoping to, to marry that person? And, and, and oftentimes, um, uh, well, there are people who got what they wanted. Maybe it's that wife or a husband right now, they're living in hell. <laughs> Hello? You might have us give us some things that we want to while we're in trouble. <laughs> but we may ask God, why are you keeping things from me? Why does he keep saying no to what I want? Why do doors keep closing in my face? Does he take pleasure in withholding that one thing I want most? And after all, he promises that no good thing will he withhold from those who walk upright. So there are bound to be many questions that will linger in our minds when we don't get that which we want from God. But at these times, one can feel somewhat frustrated and confused. And you might say, this, I thought God loved me. I thought God wanted the best for me. And this is still true, because God is still love, and his love is unconditional. His love is everlasting. But because he sees the bigger picture, he sees what will become of you if he were to give you what you wanted. But he also knows what you will become if he gives you exactly what you need. Because he knows the plans that he has for you. Plans for good and not for evil. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God has your best interest at heart. Believe that. He has your best interest at heart. If we look at the book of 1 Samuel chapter 8, many of you will be uh, familiar with the, the, the story here in this particular text. Samuel was now uh, an old man. He appointed his sons into leadership, but he was nearing retirement. Uh, and the people didn't feel that his sons were fit to take over from him. Their lives were contrary, uh, and there was something living right. And so in verse 5 of chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, they requested for a king. As a spiritual conscious and leader of Israel, Samuel knew that the selection of a king was a mistake. And in verse 7 
of chapter 8, some of the talks about the situation to God. And God says, give them what they want. He said, they are not rejecting you, they are rejecting me after all that I have done for them. Now the fact that they went to the king was no surprise because God indicated that the time would probably come when uh, Israel would ask for a king. And we can look at that in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14 to 20. God indicates that the time will come, not that it's his will, but the time will come when the Israelites will probably request for a king. So it was nothing new. The Israelites said, we want a king to lead us like other nations. Now I want us to understand that sometimes we need to check our motives for desiring the things that we want from God. Is it for selfish reasons, such as pride, uh, or to look good, or to impress others, or to look kind of, or to be kind of boastful? The Israelites wanted laws. They wanted an army, a human monarch instead of God. They wanted to run the nation through human strength and strategies. But what they needed was to continue to trust God and keep him as their true leader. Now there are times when we want, or when what we want is only because we see other people have it. And because we want to be like them. We think that because they have what we want, they are better off than we are. And therefore we believe if we have what they have, we were just as good as them, or even better than them. And sometimes I listen to women, that dress would look better on me. <laughs> that suit would look better on me. Am I choking anybody? <laughs> and we believe if we have that thing, we'll be successful. And we'll feel better about ourselves. But it appears that the Israelites were envious of the other nations. They had the presence of a physical leader to rule over them and to lead them into battle. And it looks quite good and quite impressive. And they said, we want one just like that. We want a leader just like that. We want to be just like them. We want to feel just like them. We want to be confident just like they are. We want to win battles just like they are doing. So they said, give us a king. They wanted to be like other nations. But God's plan was for them to be a unique people, set apart with God as their true leader. So God said to the Israelites in Leviticus 20, verse 6, verse 6, He says, You are to be a holy people to me, because I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the nation to be my own. And this was a great privilege that no other nation enjoyed. That God had called the Israelites to be his very own people. They were meant to be different, but now they wanted to be the same. So check your motives. Do not desire things because other people have them. Make sure that what you want is what God wants for you. Hallelujah. So in verse 9 of chapter 8, God says, warn them about the way a king would reign over them. Between verse 10 and 18, Samuel warns them and tries to dissuade them, but to no avail. You know, sometimes that thing that we want, that thing that we desire, is no good for us. Or it has potential to cause us harm, to cause us to lose focus. Or to, or to impact on our relationship with God, but yet we still insist that we want that thing. God told Samuel three times in verse 7, verse 9, and 22, give the people what they want. And after warning them of the changes that lie ahead, the people replied in the affirmative in verse 19 to 22. He said, but the people refused to listen to Samuel's warnings, 
Even so, we still want a king, they said. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. You know when you want something so bad, it's difficult to see disaster and the potential consequences. We want it so bad that no matter what anybody says to you, we persuade ourselves that it's going to be okay. And you know, often I think about Eve in the garden talking to the serpent. She was in conversation for so long that by the time the serpent finished, it was a dumb deal. Because he said to her, basically, it's not so bad after all. So, so you want it so badly that you're thinking of all how you would look if you had it, how you would feel if you had it, and it ain't so bad after all. And the more you think about it, you persuade yourself that it's okay. So although you were told in the first place that it's not good for you, you want it so bad as you're thinking of all the benefits rather than the, the negatives. And so you, you say, I want it. Anyway, this is what the Israelites said. We want a king anyway. My God. So the time came when they got what they wanted. They got their man. They got a king. They were like every other nation now. But God didn't want them to be like any other nation. For God's plans uh, were to include success for his people and prosperity. And his power based upon their faith, not military might. But as time wore on, they became integrated. Remember, they were warned of what would happen should they get what they wanted. And the time came when they intermingled with others and lost sight of their need to follow God. They lost sight of the need to follow Jehovah completely. They adopted the standards and practices of the pagan nations. They prostituted themselves and lapsed into unfaithfulness to Almighty God. So there are some consequences to getting the things that we want. Now sometimes God's greatest judgment is in giving us what we think we want. Allowing us to have our own way. And judgment can occur when God gives uh, an, an individual believer or a church or a nation what they want. This is called his permissive will. And sometimes there are serious consequences when God allows his permissive will to be done. But God sometimes, you know, we might say, for example, that God promised to give us the desires of our hearts. And we might quote that Psalms 34, verse 7. So, so when you want what you want, you quote the scripture, oh, but God promised to give me the desires of my heart. But the Bible says, delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. But we only, when we want the thing so badly, we omit the first bit, and we focus on what we want. But the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord. You've got to be in the presence of somebody in order to delight in them. So what the Word of God is saying is you spend time in the presence of God and you love on Him and you get to know Him as you read His Word and you adore Him and you acknowledge how powerful He is, how great He is, you acknowledge His faithfulness, you are delighting yourself in Almighty God. And when you do this, I guarantee you, there will be a shift in your thinking. And so when you begin to desire from God, your desires will come in alignment with what God wants for your life. And so your focus will no longer be on what I want, but I will want what God wants. And we will pray according to the will of Almighty God. So it's not about what He wants, it's what God desires for you. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. When we begin to delight in the Lord, as I said, there will be a shift and our desires will come into alignment with what God desires from us. 
will be prayed in accordance with his perfect will for our lives. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. You know, God doesn't only give us things, but God gives us people. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't give us people that we want sometimes. He gives us people that we need. People to help us. People to hurt us. People to leave us. People to love you. People to make you the person that you are meant to be. And as such, there will be times when God allows his permissive will to be done. There are times when he will need to intervene in order to bring about his perfect will for your lives. You know, there are people who God allows to be in our lives and they are only there, well, they're there for us a reason and a season. Yes. Yes. And sometimes we want these people so badly in our lives that when the time, when the time comes for them to leave, we want to hold on to them. They have made their contribution to our lives, but we want to hold on to them. And before you know it, these people stop talking to you. They delete you from the WhatsApp group. They don't return your phone call. They even block your number. And you don't let them want it. But this is where God has to intervene and take certain people from your life. Because they've done their time. And he wants to give you what you need. People to take you to the next phase of your life. And so sometimes he allows his perfect will to be done. So don't be surprised when some people delete you from the WhatsApp group and stop talking to you and block your number. God is working something out. He wants the best for you. And some people you have and are holding on to, you know they're no good, but they make you feel good. They make you look good. And so you're holding on to them. Them same people will mess you up. The king is going to mess you up. Conscript your sons into battle. Take the young daughters and, and servants and all kind of. What is it? We still want the king despite the consequences. And you know these people are going to mess you up when you feel good. They make you look good. Because I kind of rub shoulders with some of the songs, so I, I feel kind of, you know, important. But it's time for us to fix up. Hello. It's time for us to fix up. Not everything that gives us is gold. Looks good. Feels good. It appeals to the emotions. But is it what God wants for me? Check your desires. Check your motives. God wants what is best. He wants to give us our best. Too often, we settle for second best. Imagine. Second best. And imagine what it does to the very heart of God when we settle for second best, when he wants to give us his very best. And if he ever allows, if he ever has to allow his permissive will to be done, trust me, it's going to be very painful. Very painful indeed. And there are a lot of people today who are sitting with regrets. If only I'd listened to what mom said, or what dad said, or if only I'd listened to the counsel that I received. You know some people, they, 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 they talk to And will tell them, you know, I advise you, yes. don't go down that road. And then go to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I, I spoke to someone, so, you know, 
and they said, but well, what do you think? And they will say, no, I think they were right, you know. I don't think she should go on her own. And you, you turn over the advice that you were given. But you want it so badly that it cancels out all the advice and the counsel of God. And you go down that road. And then when you get bite, <laughs> oh God, if only I listened to what they told me, then I wouldn't be in this predicament. And there are many people who are living with scars because they didn't listen and they didn't take counsel and they allowed the desire of their heart what they wanted to dictate. And now they're paying a terrible price. For my encouragement to us today, check our motives. Delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Because those desires will be in line with what he desires for you. His perfect will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. Glory to God. We serve an awesome God who knows just what we need when we need it. And he loves us enough to give us what we need and not what we want so that we can do or so we do not fall short of his best for us i'm finished hallelujah so it's not what you want but it's what you need i wonder if some people want to let go of their wants today and they want to surrender their wants to the Lord and say, not my will, but thy will be done. Hallelujah. Who did I speak to this morning? Who did the Spirit of God trouble this morning, this afternoon? Maybe you want to surrender your want to the Lord today. Maybe you want to come and say, I surrender all to you. My will, my wants, my desires, my ambitions, I surrender them all to you so that your perfect will can be done in my life. Are you here today? Withholding nothing, I surrender all to you. Will you come and let us pray with you? I didn't preach long today, so give you time if you want to come and pray before the Lord today. Hallelujah. I surrender all to
and for you. You know you're not a Christian. The God has been good to you. We allow you to be in this place today to hear the word.